This is AP Psychology, Chapter 10, Part 2. Uh, we left off with Insight. Insight shows that brain imaging and EEG studies suggest that when an insight strikes, we have the aha experience. It activates the right temporal cortex. Jung and Beeman discovered this in 2004. The time between not knowing and the solution and realizing it is a uh, 0.3 tenths of a second. And so you go from not knowing to not knowing, or, or not knowing to knowing in that rate of speed. So uh, our tendency to search for conf confirming information may have important implications for our social judgments. Elder and Schaefer presented each participant with the following scenario. Imagine that you serve on a jury of only child soul custody case following a relatively messy divorce. The facts of the case are complicated by the ambiguous economic, social, and emotional considerations. And you decide to base your decision entirely on the following few observations. To which parents would you award soul custody? Parent A, who has an average income, average health, average working hours, and reasonable rapport with the child a relatively stable social life? Or would you go with parent B, who has an above average income, minor health problem, lots of work-related travel, and a very close relationship with the child, and an extremely active social life? Most participants chose to award custody to parent B. Interestingly, however, when a different group is given the same scenario and asked which parent you they would deny custody, the majority would select parent B. Paradoxically, parent B is thought to be both more and less worthy of caring for the child. Why is this? When asked who would who should be awarded custody, people who look primarily for positive qualities and pay less attention to negative qualities. This perspective leads them to favor parent B because of the close relationship with the child and the high income. When asked who should be denied custody, people look primarily for negative qualities and pay less attention to the positive qualities. This too leads them to parent B because of the health problems and extensive absences due to travel. David Levy explains how we often employ strategies for eliciting information from others that support our initial beliefs about them. For example, in one study, college students were instructed to conduct interviews with other students to assess the presence of certain personality traits. Half were asked to determine if the interviewee was an extrovert, and the other half were asked to determine if he, what, he or she was an introvert. Findings indicated that the subjects were also, who were asked to ascertain whether the interviewee was an extrovert chose an extroversion-related questions. For example, what would you do if you wanted to liven things up at a party? Whereas those seeking to determine if the interviewee was an introvert asked introversion-related questions. For example, what factors make it really hard for you to open up to people? As a result, those who were tested for extroversion actually appeared more extroverted. Those who were tested for introversion appeared more introverted. Interviewers found that personality traits for which they were probing simply on the basis of questions they chose to ask. In similar ways, argues Levy, therapists may selectively elicit clinical information that affirms their initial diagnostic impressions. For example, therapists who think new therapy may be an alcoholic may be asked questions regarding his drinking habits. Have you ever had an occasion to drink alone? His history of substance abuse. Have you ever had hangovers? Any lapses of memory? Have you ever forgotten events that happened to you the night before? Experiences with depression. depression. Do you sometimes feel very sad and possible mar marital conflicts? Do you have arguments with your wife? All responses may confirm the belief that the patient is a closet drinker. The problem, of course, is that many people who are not alcoholics may drink by themselves, have endured hangovers, have occasional lapses in memory, and suffer through periods of depression and argue with their wives. More gen gen generally, therapists' own 
personal and personal beliefs may lead them to elicit information from clients that confirms their particular theoretical orientation. Thus, Freudians may search and be more likely to find unconscious motivational conflicts. Behaviorists may find maladaptive learning patterns, and cognitive theorists may discover irrational belief systems. So what we're going to do now is contrast confirmation bias and fixation and how they can interfere with efficient problem solving. Obstacles in problem solving is confirmation bias, a tendency to search for bias information that confirms a personal uh, bias. 2 minus 4 minus 6. Rule any ascending series of numbers. 1 minus 2 minus 3 would comply. SS had difficulty figuring out the rule due to confirmation bias. A major obstacle to problem solving is our eagerness to search for information that confirms our ideas, a phenomenon known as confirmation bias. This may mean that once people form the wrong idea, they will not budge from their illogic. This, this, this can mean that, uh, that once a people form wrong idea, they may not budge from their illogic. Another obstacle to problem solving is fixation. The inability to see a problem from a fresh perspective. The tendency to repeat solutions that have worked in the past is a type of fixation called a mental set. It may interfere with our taking a fresh approach when faced with problems that demand an entirely new solution. Our tendency to perceive the functions of objects as fixed, unchanging, is called functional fixedness. Perceiving the uh, Relating familiar things in new ways is an important aspect of our creative problem solving. So fixation and inability to see problems from a fresh perspective. This impedes the problem of solving. Two examples of fixation are mental set and functional fix fixedness. The matchstick problem. How would you arrange the six matchsticks to form equilateral triangles? Here's another problem. Using the candle, the thumbtacks, and the, and the box of matches, how would you attach the candle to the bulletin board? This is the solution to the matchstick problem. And here is the solution to the candle mounting problem. Quick decisions sometimes lead us to ignore important information to underestimate our chances to solving something. Uh, our mental set is a tendency to approach a problem in a particular way, especially if that was successful in the past. Here's another problem that we can do. If you were to take these two ropes, you tie the, two, the solution would be to tie the two ropes together Use the screwdriver and together the cotton balls and uh, use a screwdriver, cotton ball, in a matchbox. And so what you do is you have to take these and tie them together. Well, you use the screwdriver as a weight, tie it to the end of the rope, swing it toward the other rope to tie the knot, and forget about the cotton balls and the matches. They are just there to distract you. The inability to think of the screwdriver as a weight is called functional fixedness because the, the screwdriver uh, serves as a tool. We normally don't think of it as a weight. Uh, two kinds of heuristics, the representative heuristic and the availability heuristics have been identified by cognitive psychologists. Representative heuristic is judging the likelihood of things or objects in terms of how well they seem to represent or match a particular prototype. If you meet a slim, short man who wears glasses and likes poetry, what do you think his profession would be? An Ivy League professor or a truck driver? Of course, most people choose Ivy League professor. Uh, but the probability is the person is a truck driver is far greater than the Ivy League professor just because there are a lot more truck drivers than there are professors. Uh, 
the availability heuristic, however, why does our availability ability heuristic lead us astray? Whatever increases the ease of retrieving information increases its perceived availability. How is retrieval facilitated? How recently we've heard about the event, how distinct it is, and how correct it is. So we need to be making decisions and uh, forming judgments. Each day we have make hundreds of judgments and decisions based on our intuition, seldom using systematic reasoning. So research suggests that we use our knowledge as the basis of developing models of what other people know. In other words, we tend to assume that other people know what we know. People's tendency to assume that others are like themselves is evident from finding that people who practice a particular behavior tend to think that that behavior is more prevalent than, do, than do those who do not engage in the same behavior. Moreover, when attempting, moreover, when attempting to assess the attitudes of specific groups, people tend to project their own attitudes onto those groups. They also see their own attitudes and behaviors as rational or normative, and those that differ as irrational or deviant. Political extremists on both sides of the spectrum question the rationality and even the mental health of their counterparts because the people often react similarly in specific situations. The heuristic like availability and representativeness makes sense. The idea that we are wise to assume others are like ourselves is captured by the principle of humanity. It states that when trying to understand when someone has just said, especially something ambiguous, we should impute to the speaker's beliefs and desires similar to our own. Obviously, this simplifies life. We could not assume that other people are like ourselves. Communicating effectively would become overwhelmingly difficult. Conversely, assuming that others possess knowledge they, they do not have can impede communication and mutual understanding. For example, classroom instruction fails if the teachers underestimate the difference between their own knowledge and that of their students. Designers of technology fail in their creation of mar marketable products if they underestimate how much difficulty other people will have in le learning to use their creations. Supporters of political candidates may exert too little electoral effort if they overestimate the popularity of their favored candidate. Research suggests that experts often overestimate what others may know about their area of expertise. For example, specialists were more likely than those with only an intermediate level of expertise to underestimate the amount of time novices would need to complete a particular task. Experts even seem to resist resistant to de-biasing de techniques that would reduce their tendency to fall victim to such underestimating. Research participants in a laboratory studies who are given privileged information sometimes behaves as if other participants have the information, even when, if asked, they readily acknowledge that others do not have that same knowledge. A particularly clever demonstration of over-imputing one's knowledge to others comes from a study which participants tap the rhythms of well-known songs that others tried to identify. The tappers estimated the likelihood that listeners would identify the songs to be about 0.5. In fact, the correct identification was about 0.025. The illusion simplicity refers to the mistaken impression that something is simple because one is familiar with it. For example, people are likely to judge prose to be appropriate for lower grade reading level if they have previously read it, if they have not. <clears throat> 